So, welcome everybody to another session of Logicals in Quarantena. On behalf of the Brazilian Logic Society and of the Logic Interest Group of the Brazilian Computer Society, I'd like to thank Professor Luiz Felipe Bartolo Alegre, who kindly accepted our invitation to give this talk. Luiz, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bruno, uh, and thank you very much to the Diretoria da Sociedade Brasileira, uh, the Logica. Uh, I really thank all the people who's present right now who has uh, attended my invitation. Uh, I'd like to start first before giving the talk by uh, saying that uh, the Peruvian Society of Logic, by, uh, which I'm uh, of which I am a member and the current president, uh, is is very interested in having uh, a lot. I love to say a lot, a lot of projects to do uh, in conjunction with the Brazilian Society of Logic. Uh, and I hope that this first uh, this first talk, in a way, uh, can uh, launch uh, a series of, of of things that we can do together. Particularly, I am interested in one thing, which is related to uh, something I have been doing very recently. Well, you see, uh, like uh, like one of your members, Walter Carnelli, <laughs> I am very interested in languages. Uh, I I had a lot of fun when I met him in Rio and also in Concepcion with Walter, we were like switching between many languages and that was a very fun experience with him. But there is one thing that worries me and maybe some of you are aware of that. Uh, many languages are, especially uh, languages that are often called native languages are disappearing. Uh, according to some studies, like uh, by the end of the century, we will have half of the languages that we currently have, which are around five or 6,000. So I was thinking, what is this to do with the Brazilian Society of Logic and the Peruvian Society for Epistemology and Logic? Well, uh, Brazil and Peru has no shortage of uh, native peoples with uh, native languages, uh, uh, of, of which are many of them uh, uh, in a very in, in dangerous condition, they are probably going to disappear at some point uh, if we don't do something about it. Mm. My, what could be interesting to do from a society interested in logic like ours is to launch projects, for example, to uh, recover, uh, for example, the logical terminology uh, of these societies, of these languages. It would be very interesting, for example, to have some kind of encyclopedia or a dictionary where anyone in the world could get in, uh, could, could, could go and consult, for example, how would you construct a conjunctive sentence in Quechua, in Shipibo, in Piralla, etc., which are languages that are spoken in our, in our countries. It would be very interesting in some, if, if at some point uh, the Peruvian and the Brazilian societies of logic and epistemology and logic, respectively, where uh, could try at we could try at some point to do something like this. Well, having said that, uh, about which we could speak more later if you want, I'd like to present uh, this talk, which is the uh, the reason I was invited to. For this Seminario Logicos in Cuarentena, I'd like to present a talk called Can We Test Inconsistent Empirical Theories? Although the title uh, could also be Can We Test Inconsistent Empirical Hypotheses or Inconsistent Empirical Sentences? Because it, all, all of this talk is trying to do is how can we uh, uh, somehow try to, if, if we accept that inconsistency does not have to mean uh, disaster in, in as far as, uh, as, as, a, as, a, as science is concerned, well, maybe there could be a way to uh, understand inconsistent empirical theories in the realm of science and therefore test them. Because it's an empirical theory that cannot be tested is not a... Uh, I, I don't want to get too uh, falsificationist here, but uh, uh, a theory that cannot be tested is uh, is basically useless as far as uh, empirical science is concerned. So I, I'm going to read the abstract and then I'm going to 
uh, as the best I can give my uh, my presentation. So in this talk, I discuss the logical possibility, the logical possibility of testing inconsistent empirical theories. The main challenge for answering this affirmatively is to avoid that the inconsistent consequences of a theory both corroborate and falsify. For example, a theory that implies uh, uh, both that uh, the Earth is in one point uh, A and it is not in one point A. Well, the observation that the Earth is in point A would be uh, bo would both falsify and corroborate the theory. Well. I answer affirmatively by showing that we can define a class of empirical sentences whose truth will force us to abandon such inconsistent theory, the class of its potential rejectors, which is an updated uh, uh, an update of the concept of potential falsifier by Popper. Despite this, I showed that the observational contradictions implied by a theory could only be verified, provided we make some assumptions but no, re not rejected. From this, it follows that although inconsistent theories are rejectable, they cannot be rejected qua inconsistent. They cannot be rejected in, in, in that they are inconsistent. Only they can be rejected uh, for, the cons for their consistent uh, consequences. So it has a seven part, although I will have to omit uh, the second part because it's, it's uh, uh, it, it's in the paper, but it would take me a, a bit more time of, of the time I, I actually have. So um, I will introduce the, the problem with, uh, with more depth. Uh, I will very briefly mention uh, uh, some things about falsification, it's just in case uh, I, I don't want to get confused by a, by a, by a dogmatic falsificationist. Then observation, I, I will speak, uh, I will give a concept of, of a, a very operational concept of observation sentences. I will speak about the empirical content of classical scientific theories. I will say, I will mention some issues of this concept of empirical content regarding the paraconsistent case. And finally, I will formulate uh, their, how does the rejection of inconsistent theories work? And well, finally, some final afterthoughts. So uh, let's have our definitions clear, but because uh, there are many ways in which we can define uh, this, uh, some of the most important concepts of, of this talk. First, inconsistency. Uh, a set of statements is inconsistency or contradictory. I will use these concepts equivalently in this talk if it contains or implies a sentence and its negation. That's inconsistency, if it contains or implies. Now, the principle of explosion says that from a contradiction follows any statement whatsoever. This can be... Uh, 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 this can be formalized in many ways, so I, I want to be a little bit vague about this, but for now, but later we are going to see a, a, a more clear way in which I, I understand the principle of explosion. Now, uh, an explosive logic is simply, that's the third definition, a system of logic or a consequence relation is explosive if it satisfies the principle of explosion. So classical logic is obviously an explosive logic. And uh, by the way, a paraconsistent logic is simply a non-explosive logic. It's basically the same. There is no difference between saying that a logic is paraconsistent and saying that it is non-explosive. Okay, so first, uh, we have to see a uh, how does paraconsistency relate to science? In particular, I'm interested in empirical science, but this could be what I'm going to say here can be applied to both uh, uh, cons to both con uh, the empirical and formal science. So we can distinguish for the purposes of this talk two versions of uh, what we may call the paraconsistent program. First, uh, a moderate uh, paraconsistent program, which is that we can reason, whose aim is that 
which states that we can reason in the presence of inconsistencies, or at least we can develop formal systems of inference with, where we need not to infer whatever we please from an inconsistent set of statements. Uh, the success of this program, by the way, would provide us with some kind of crutch while we do not have something better. It, that's a bit of the idea of this moderate version of the program. They are not uh, using the um, but a consistency as a feature of uh, of a model or a, or or of a of a conception of the world or a theory of the world or whatever. They are using it like uh, some kind of of crutch for uh, trying to make uh, a, a defective conception of the world, defective theory work uh, for our uh, pre for predictive purposes. Now, the other conception is dialetheism, uh, who's uh, the uh, the whose coiner of the name is Graham Priest here uh, here present, which says that some sentences are both true and false, which means that uh, there are true contradictions or dialetheism, as he calls it. The existence of what we may call empirical dialetheas, besides has been suggested by the cost and priest. Now, I know here, uh, I know some people would not agree that the cost uh, has, has suggested th this idea. But if you read, if you review the third chapter of, of the ensayo, which uh, is currently in the process of being translated by, into English too, but if you read that, uh, that chapter, you will see that at some point, he suggests that it is possible that uh, that we may at some point find uh, something like a true contradiction, and that it is easier to to verify the hypothesis that there are true contradictions that falsify it. So even avant the lettre, before the name or without the name, uh, Da Costa has suggested this idea. It doesn't matter uh, that. Da Costa is not a dialetheist. He's not, as far as uh, I, I, I have read him, he doesn't seem to be a dialetheist, but he has suggested the possibility, which means that uh, the concept was present in him somehow. And well, Priest, we know uh, that he has suggested it many times, most notably in the book <laughs> Dub True to be a Liar, uh, which uh, has two uh, remarkable sections, uh, which were previously papers. One is called, if I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not completely sure of the names, but one was observing contradictions, and the other one I think was um, inconsistency and empirical science, which were papers published in 1999 and 2002, if I'm not wrong. So. All of this make us think, well, if, if there is this idea of paraconsistency in science, we can uh, use paraconsistent logics to formalize or to, or as the basic basis for the deductive system of an inconsistent theory, then maybe we should not uh, uh, throw inconsistent theories out of empirical science. So may there be a place for observationally inconsistent theories in the empirical sciences? Well, maybe. However, the procedure for testing an inconsistent empirical theory has been barely discussed with, within and without the paraconsistent program. I mentioned one case, which I'm going to discuss uh, later, which was uh, in Priest's article, Inconsistency and Empirical Sciences. Uh, there is another one, a bit uh, more, uh, um, perhaps uh, not, uh, it doesn't touch it as deeply as I as in this paper, but it was my thesis advisor, Luis Piscoya, who in a book called uh, uh, Educational uh, Investigation or Research, Educational Research, in a small chapter, he discusses the possibility of whether uh, inconsistent theories could ever satisfy the principle of falsifiability. So he touches upon the subject. Um, well, my aim here in this talk is to explore 
the problem of formally, formally, I, I, I emphasize that word, defining the empirical content of inconsistent, although non-trivial, empirical theories. And, well, this for several considerations is not equivalent to the problem of defining the class of potential falsifiers of such theories. It's not the same uh, uh, because uh, of, of, of an important consideration we're going to see, but the false, if, if we're speaking, in the, if we are uh, framing the discussion in dialectism, uh, the inconsistent consequences of a theory, at least some of them, might be uh, true contradictions, which means that they are true or false. So it doesn't make too much sense to falsify what is already false. In, in any case, the act of falsifi falsification is not necessarily an act of uh, that would make us reject that theory. It's not. Uh, it's not that it wouldn't be an effect of the theory to be false because it is already uh, part of its uh, of its content of its uh, pre-established content. So, a bit more precisely, what I want, what I intend to is to extend Popper's concept of potential falsifier, so that not only classical consistent theories but also some inconsistent theories, some can have a class of statements that are incompatible with them. Well, incompatible, is it's here uh, used a bit informally, but it, it's probably going to be more clear later what do we mean by incompatible. Uh, this class I will call the class of potential rejectors. Uh, now, uh, some, some characteristics of this proposal is that it's going to be applicable to both, consist, both consistent and inconsistent theories because uh, it will preserve basically the properties of the classical concept of uh, potential falsifier or observationally consistent theories. It will hold regardless of how the inconsistency is regarded, either as a flaw to be corrected by a future consistent substitute or as a feature that help us describing properly consistent phenomena as the dialectics would want it, for example. And I will uh, at least contend that uh, uh, if I am right, this will signify a pyrrhic victory for uh, the empirical dial taste, uh, uh, as we would not be able to reject inconsistent theories quite inconsistent, as I have already advanced. So it will be uh, sort of a dogmatic, uh, it will leave in a somewhat dogmatic position to dialectics. Now, uh, as I said, I, I'm not going to speak too much about this uh, falsification. Maybe if you want to ask me later, I can I can explain. But the idea is that uh, throughout this talk, I I am probably you probably will notice a, a dogmatic language where. Uh, a potential falsifier will seem to be somehow of a, uh, of, of like something that in the practice would out automatically falsify a theory. That's that would be the vision of a of a of a dogmatic falsification. Is like the like potential falsifiers of a theory are sentences such that if we were to find that they are true, they would uh, immediately uh, make us reject the theory. But this is not my vision. I, I, what, what I, what I explain in some depth in that section of the article that you can access uh, through the link I gave you, is that uh, the dogmatic language of falsification is is connected to, uh, to the more uh, what Lakatos call uh, naive can be mapped into into a naive. Uh, uh, conception of falsification is towards particular theories, not towards whole research programs, but the, towards the, for example, the conjunction of not only a theoretical statement, but a background hypothesis. And that could also be mapped into a more sophisticated attitude towards programs. But I don't, I, I, I don't think this is the proper place to explain that in depth. So I, I leave it for those who are interested to check it in the paper. 
but what I need to explain in some depth are is the concept of observation sentences because um, this is where this is where I will be able to it's to say uh, some things about uh, that are probably at the basis of my of my proposal. So first, we have to uh, explain what what is the what is the framework uh, we are going to work in? So, if we are, uh, if we want to uh, talk about uh, about the reality or or whatever uh, kind of entities science is a particular scientific discipline is trying to capture, we have to do it through a language, and the language can be, of course, uh, the informal language, or it can be a formal language. Of course, scientists is not that scientists use systematically uh, formal language, but uh, when philosophers of science or logicians or epistemologists try to uh, try to have a formal understanding of, of what scientists do, well, they use uh, in, at least at some points some formal language. And that scientific or formal language, uh, in that in that formal language, has some characteristics like, for example, rules of uh, formation, like, for example, uh, the use of some logical connectives or first order quantifiers, etc. But regardless of whether we are speaking about a, a, a formal language or an informal language, we have normally two kinds of sentences, not necessarily are the only one two kinds of sentences but we have at least two uh, two kinds of sentences within within our whole uh, set of sentences uh, that comprises in scientific language the first one would be the theoretical sentences which are mm, uh, uh, like unverifiable in that no convention, in the sense that no convention is sufficient for determining directly from experience or in our interpretation of, in, or, or our simplest interpretations of experience, that they are true. Uh, they usually have the logical form of universal sentences. For example, for all X and Y, the speed of X is less or equal than the speed of light in vacuum at circumstance Y. That is a form, more or less, of a theoretical sentence. Of course, it could there could be even uh, we could speak about uh, a theoretical sentence of a higher uh, of a higher level. But I, I don't care too much to hear about uh, distinguishing between higher or lower level uh, theoretical sentences. We also have. Uh, what we co may call observation sentences. And this has always been a problem because there is nothing in the reality that, because observations do not verify uh, sentences, but these sentences are verifiable in the sense that experts can intersubjectively reach an agreement on whether the possible fact denoted by one such sentence is actually a fact, is an actual fact. This is more or less idea proposed a long time ago by uh, 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 by okay I, I forgot the name but it was one of the most important uh, logical positivists the one who wrote about explanation well I, I the name escapes me right now but the idea is that uh, the, the ob observation sentences are, obs are are verifiable in that experts can reach an agreement on whether uh, that sentence is true or not. Now, the logical form of a singular sentence or is that of singular of or existential sentences. Like for some x and y, the speed of x is less or equal than the speed of light at circumstance y. And that speed of a, a being a, 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 a particular object, a singular object is less or equal to, than uh, the speed of light at circumstance y. So these are sentences that if experts can, uh, for example, try to say, well, here is object A, this is circumstance y, 
so we know more or less the speed of light, they can more or less reach an agreement that this sentence is true. Now, I there is one important thing here. Uh, Popper is not very clear in throughout his book. Uh, I, I have reviewed, in fact, both both versions and, and sometimes the translations, I mean the English and the German version, sometimes the translations do not agree, but an inconsistency that is in in both books, in, in both versions of the book, it, of his uh, Logique de Fortune, is that for some, is, is that it is not clear if for Popper, uh, observation sentences have to be singular sentences or existential sentences. Uh, sometimes he explicitly says that it has they have to be existential sentences. In some cases, he gives some examples that make it look that it has to be singular sentences or particular sentences. So, but in any case, what I the, the, the sentences I'm going to use as observation sentences are going to be singular sentences. Uh, again, there, I, I give a whole explanation in the paper of why this have to be like this. There, there are good reasons for this uh, decision, but I leave it for the uh, for those who are interested in, uh, in, 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 in for for them to read the paper if they want to, or maybe you can ask me in the Q and A later. So. Um, Here's a, an important uh, part of the of the justification of that, by the way, but very rapidly say, the negation of uh, of a, an existential sentence is not an existential sentence, but a universal sentence. And what I want is that the negation of a uh, of a the negation of an observation sentence be an observation sentence too, which is why particular sentences have. Uh, have, are, are more likely to fulfill that condition. But the question here uh, that comes here is, is if the negation of any singular sentence whatsoever, which expresses an observable state of the first, also expresses an observable state of the first by necessity. And this is no trivial matter because uh, it's there is no a priori reason or or at least no immediately immediately obvious reason why this should be so well here i defend a series of uh, theses on uh, the nature of observability which are uh, whereby i try to justify this and before going on i'd like to know how much time more uh, do i have Bruno, what's the? Sorry, buddy, I had some problem with my connection. I lost the last two minutes. Ah, uh, uh, Mr. Philip is asking how long does he have to talk? Uh, well, it's up to you. Usually, maybe more five or ten minutes is okay. I'd I much rather have fifteen. Okay. In order not to, but well. Here are my thesis on observability, which are whereby I try to justify that uh, an ob the, the negation of an observation sentence is also has also to be an observation sentences sentence, given that we are speaking about singular sentences. So uh, maybe I will have to explain some of these, but uh, unless you see any of them very problematic, I will. I will just read them um, uh, and, and go on with the talk. The first is that uh, op, uh, it's more, more, more than a thesis, it's more like a, a convention. Uh, to say that phi, that a sentence, an observable sentence, is observable doesn't necessarily mean that it's, it's currently observable. Uh, and there is an example that I have to give about this. Which I, which I have in my uh, in my paper. Uh, example is the following. Uh, for example, the concept of musical pitch was already implicit in Pythagoras. Hence, it is reasonable to assume that he could have 
understood the meaning of the following two sentences. The pitch of that whistle is uh, B8, or, or sorry, B6. That's the first one. The second would be the pitch of that whistle is B10. Now, he could have understood both sentences, right? But the problem is the following. He could only observe, in this case here, by observe I mean any form of detecting experience, uh, the, the first one of those, that the pitch of the whistle is uh, B6. Uh, because uh, it that sound is within his ear range. He can hear, he could hear uh, with, his, with his own ears that sound. Instead, B10 is a, is a, is a pitch that is beyond the ears of, uh, I think uh, all human beings is a, is a pitch of 31.6 kilohertz. I mean, probably there is some person, some people who can hear that, that high, but it's not, uh, it's, it's, it's not very common. If, if that is the case. So certainly I'm, I'm sure that Pythagoras couldn't, but today we can uh, verify this sentence, uh, but we need a, an instrument like something like, a, like a, 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 an instrument for measuring uh, the pitch of, of a sound that the human ear cannot detect. Now, uh, uh, now this is uh, this may be like a funny example, but remember that uh, we have we have a more current example where where uh, where gravitational waves were predicted like 100 years ago, and they were only observed right now. So in my concept of observability, whatever we can. Uh, what, whatever sentence for which we can uh, find ways, uh, uh, theoretically at least, to uh, detect through uh, uh, our senses and with the help of some instruments, and that could be established with the help of those instruments by the proper experts as true or false, uh, those kind of sentences are observable. That is, to be observable doesn't mean that we have to be able to observe it right now. It could be that we still lack the proper instruments for doing so. Now, the second thesis is that for all uh, singular sentence, singular observation sentence, there is another one that logically entails its negation. Now, I have a justification for that, uh, which is that uh, basically, um, suppose that there was no, uh, no sentence C that can logically entail the negation of phi. Well, if this was the case, this would mean that our language cannot express an observable states of affair, a state of affairs, sorry, incompatible with C, and this would be either because P necessarily holds or this language is not expressive enough. Now, if P necessarily holds, uh, well, this this is an, it would be a necessary claim, and this is not precisely within the concept of observability I'm looking for. So it's an irrelevant case. And uh, if our language is not expressive enough, then, well, that's not the kind of language we should use for our, uh, for our, um, it's, it's not the kind of language we should use for science, we should aim to use a better, a better uh, language. So that's the justification of this second thesis. Now, the third one is uh, basically states that um if we have a we can construct basically the negation of a phi like a long disjunction of all the sentences of, of all the observation sentences that are uh, uh, somehow uh, mutually exclusive with uh, 
with uh, with the initial sentence. In, and I give gonna give an example which goes a bit, which makes the formula a, a bit not so hard on the eyes. Um, for example, uh, we we might say, for example, of some object that it is red. So, what would be the disjunction corresponding that, that would be equivalent to the negation of that? What is the disjunction equivalent to, to say that, uh, uh, for example, this pencil is red? Well, the disjunction would be this pencil is blue, or this pencil is green, or this pencil is black, or this pencil, etc. All the color spectrum that may be necessary for excluding red. It's not the, a perfect example, but it gives you more or less idea. So, the fourth thesis, which is an is, which is a color a colorary of the of the third, is that the negation of any observation sentence is also an observation sentence. Which, by the way, and and this is why this is this is. Uh, uh, more or less reconstructing Graham's argument for for uh, the observability of contradictions. This would mean, according to him, that if we have if if uh, the, that observation it also is uh, related to uh, observation is not just is not pure. It exists also. It's given also by the categories of our thought. That, what does that mean? That, for example, the categories like the logical categories are part of our observation. He gives an example, which is uh, if I am watching a photograph of one of two identical twins, which we don't know which one it is, then we may be in a doubt about whether we are seeing Ted or Ned, which are, in this case, the names of those identical twins. So it is fair, it is uh, appropriate, according to Graham Priest, to say that we are seeing a picture or of Ned or we are seeing a picture of Ted. Because that's, that disjunction will be true, uh, would be, would be uh, made true according to that observation of that picture. So from that, uh, he, well, he gives another. Uh, uh, he gives. He gives. A, he gives. He gives a, um, a more complete argument for this. But the idea is that since this, the categories of of thought are uh, help us to, uh, ob in observation, it is not. Uh, it is conceivable that we can see uh, several kinds of of uh, molecular sent of of sentences which have. Uh, the logical form of some molecular sentences. Among them would be the conjunction. Now, since I don't, since I don't completely subscribe this thesis, I will just enunciate it as a postulate, which is not going to be very useful for me for now. But um, there is one interesting thing that uh, related to this. It is, it is that. Uh, Graham Priest, in some paper, I I think in, in in the second edition of his In Contradiction, says of Andreas Boberlieff that he would be something like a semantic dialectic. Uh, I, I would like Graham later to clarify what what is that because later uh, in in 2019, uh, Andres gave a whole talk uh, trying to in part to to like uh, make uh, like try to 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 be free free to free himself from that accusation because he doesn't like the the that characterization of his of his self but uh, the point uh, of graham i think was that uh, for andres um, there are no negative facts because negation is precisely uh, a a uh, it's not something that reflects or represents something in reality, but something that we do with reality. So there is no perception of negative facts. Negation says uh, Andres is an operation given by by virtue of our category schemes. 
Now, if for Graham, infer of playing a role in observation is precisely what we do with reality, uh, and that is part of the process of seeing, then we can see that something is not red by simply by seeing that it is incompatible with redness. Um, so it is in this sense, I think that uh, like the Graham states uh, in, 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 in his book, In Contradiction, that the world is, as such is not the kind of thing that can be consistent or inconsistency. Consistency is a property of sentences. It is, but now what you can say that it is possible to extend the domain of these properties by specifying that a word is consistent if any purely descriptive sentence about it is consistent and inconsistent otherwise. So, uh, and Robin Ritz's remarks may even be taken as part of the foundations of uh, semantic dialectism, as, uh, as I already said, that Priest characterizes his position. Although, even when this was totally against his, the, against Andres' intentions. Mm. Now, my my point with this with this is strange image is that my point with this image is the following that our remarks may even be taken part of course as the semantic dial of the semantic dial things and Chris himself Graham himself said at some point that the observable word is consistent since our perceptions of the word are entirely consistent, except for the odd visual illusions. So it is not certain that he, that Raham believes this, but under the semantic conception, uh, under the semantic dialectism he ascribes to Bob and Reed, one may even joke that you can verify that it is, that it is both uh, 134 uh, and 9.941, uh, 9 hence, that it is not 134 if the screen of your phone is like the figure I am showing you. Uh, in this figure, you see that at the center, it is 134, and at the upper left corner, it is 941. So maybe, maybe I'm sure that this wasn't Graham's intention, or maybe he says that it was, but uh, it looks like uh, when, when you, when you, that the, the idea of semantic dialectism would be related to this to this kind of observation. Well, in any case, now we are going to try to uh, go to the substance of this paper, which is the idea of the empirical content of, of classical scientific theories first, and then the paraconsistent case. Now, very rapidly, I have to say that I am using the syntactic view, unlike uh, other proposals like that from Stephen French and the Costa, Octavio Bueno, or Maria Martinez, because uh, there are several advantages to the syntactic view over the semantic view, as uh, when we are concerned with, uh, uh, when we are trying to do, a, 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 when we are trying to, understand this problem not from the perspective of uh, simply uh, when we we want to do a translogical treatment of this problem that's what i wanted to say when we don't want to simply uh, have a treatment that is just good if you we use a certain kind of uh, of paraconsistent logic but we want to be uh, as wide as we can in our treatment now, of course, in the syntactic theory, a theory is expressed as a set of sentences or formulae clothed with respect to some consequence relation. And why the syntactic view? Well, my reason basically for preparing this treatment to, the sem to a semantic one is that the latter would require fully specifying the set of logical symbols to be used, the semantics of these symbols, and the properties of our consequence relation. We ha would have to specify that in full. Um, uh, this, is a, this is a problem because uh, I, I, I don't want this to be 
just about a particular conception of paraconsistent logic. And I also want this treatment to be an extension of, of Popper's original view. And if I use a particular conception of paraconsistent logic, I risk to make it useless for the original case. I would have to like specify one for each. And I would I, I prefer for this reason the syntactic view because I just need to specify some properties like the minimal properties common to all symbols, which I am not doing here, but it's very fairly uh, easy. I do it in some other uh, presentations I had before that I can share uh, with you if you ask me. Now, here is where my uh, my slides are starting to fail. So I'm going to jump to the paper. Give me just one minute. Okay, can you see my... Uh... Yes, you can see it. But uh, well, it's cut it on the right part. Okay, now it's perfect. Okay. If at some point you need me to, uh, to uh, maximize some part, just let me know. So, okay, I, it's, it's not going to be too easy on the ice, but here is the idea. In order for, for us to formally define this, we need to formally define the empirical basis of a theory. Uh, I will introduce uh, a concept that is implicit in Popper, but it's not, uh, as far as I remember, it's never formulated explicit. It's, he talks about the uh, potential falsifiers, which a, a more literal translation of the original term used by Popper would be uh, possibilities of falsification or something like that. But here uh, we have another concept that it's, like I said, implicit, which would be the potential corroborator. Now, Popper would uh, probably fanatically oppose to the existing of, that, of this concept because uh, whatever for him resembles verification, uh, it's, it's not something he welcomes a lot, but I don't care too much here. Uh, in this case, because I am using it for a, a, a kind of case that is not very like the ones he treated, the one he treated, the, the consistent and classical case. Well, the, corroborate, the, the, the potential corroborators would be simply the set of sentences that uh, the of of uh, observation sentences that are implied logically implied by our theory by T. So CEO of T, it's just the set of all those sentences, observation sentences that are logically entailed by T. Now the potential falsifiers are more or less, uh, we can define them more or less as, as Popper does. Now, I, I have to I have to say, well, I, I will say, it, I will define first and then I'm going to make my note which is F of, FA of T, that is potential falsifiers of T, it's the set of all those sentences, uh, observation sentences, such that their negations are implied by T. Now, I have to say that this is a, uh, this is not a fully proper treatment of falsificationism because the original concept uh, of falsification is, uh, of, of falsification requires to make uh, like a full uh, uh, constructive definition first of the concept of event, then the concept of occurrence, and then make a much more uh, 
stronger treatment uh, from predicate logic and and so I am not doing this here for many reasons, basically because of space, but whoever is interested uh, and, and can read the Spanish can check my uh, my master dissertation. I, I, I make the full treatment in there. Now, I, I am also going to publish this in a paper in English, but I am I am struggling to finish the paper because I am I keep adding more and more things and and but whenever it's ready i I'm, I'm sure i'm going to share it with when whoever wants to read it now the empirical basis having defined the potential corroborators and falsifiers the empirical basis can of a classical theory can be defined as an order pair between comprising sorry the potential corroborators and falsifiers now this can be extended to a to, uh, definition of the empirical content of our research program in the Lakatosian way, but this is not going to be important for now. Uh, but let us notice one thing in here, which is we could very easily define the, potent, the, the empirical basis of the, of the theory from, we don't need this tuple, this whole tuple. We just need any of those two because we can define the set of potential falsifiers from the set of potential corroborators and vice versa in classical theories. It is it is uh, a bit redundant in this way. We're going to see that this is not the case for inconsistent theories because it's not necessarily redundant to state that uh, these two separately because we cannot always define uh, the potential corroborator set from the set of potential falsifiers and this is due to one very important uh, characteristic of paraconsistent logic something that uh, makes it particularly uh, different from classical logic and it is that And basically, that difference is that, um, okay, so I say that we can reduce empirical context of either potential corroborators or fal falsifiers set to, a, to the other. But this would not be advisable for observational inconsistent theories. As I have shown in my previous remarks, the empirical theory of an observational inconsistent theory, T, would be such that uh, both phi and its negation would be both uh, potential corroborators and falsifiers. And this would be a problem because, because this would put uh, our theory uh, in an uncertain, epistemically uncertain position towards the sentences, to sentence phi, because it would be a sentence that would both give us reason to reject and to uh, and to uh, and to into accept um, and this is not uh, a, a very good position to be in especially when we would have that uh, uh, we would basically we would think that uh, these sentences are uh, uh, being observation sentences we don't have reason much reason too many reasons to believe that they could go that the, that the principle of an excluded third would not hold for them. So, but there is uh, another important thing, which is that, uh, which is that uh, the, the classical logic and uh, paraconsistent logic are very different in one fundamental aspect, which is that in Classical logic, when we have a logical connective, what we have is we can define it, uh, for example, by stating that A star B, alpha star beta is true in such and such conditions and false otherwise, or vice versa too. But this is not the case for paraconsistent logics, as it may be that both alpha and, and alpha negated, not alpha, are true or false or both. 
uh, depending on the semantics. Uh, but more interestingly, though, it could be the case that a theory formalized under a paraconsistent logic, a theory whose uh, whose underlying logic is a paraconsistent one, is not necessarily a theory where, for example, this is not precisely the kind of theory where a given sentence, if if it's if it's uh, if it's an, if it if a given sentence is implied by the theory T, it doesn't immediately mean that its negation is not implied because uh, we can be sure because it's perfectly possible that they are both implied in the theory is not trivial. Instead, if we have a theory that presumably is a is a is a is a non-trivial theory. Uh, it, which is a classical theory that is it is uh, its underlying logic is classical that definitely means that if we or, or, or presumably means that if a sentence is implied by that theory its negation will not be implied unless we are wrong about we are, our assumption that such theory is uh, is uh, non-trivial because it would be automatically make it trivial if we had an, an underlying classical logic. So, what do we? Why? Why is all of this important? Because this means that uh, an inconsistent theory uh, cannot be just tested uh, for in in the in the classical Popperian way. We cannot just uh, take an, one sentence and try to uh, just falsify it and and if it is not falsified we keep accepting the theory because we have a very uh, we have we cannot test in this way the inconsistent uh, consequences of, of our theory so what I conclude is that any inconsistent theory has to, would have to go undergo a twofold uh, testing process uh, any, I mean, empirically or observationally inconsistent theory, where we first have to fail to reject some regular observational consequences over the theory. So uh, those sentences that are that we know that are implied but not their negations, or that are not implied but are their negations. It's not contradictory theorems that is. So those observation sentences that are implied by T, but not their negations. We have those we can uh, test in a very Popperian way, but we also need to verify some of their unfalsifiable, that is, unrejectable observational consequences. That is, their contradictory observational consequences, like those sentences, uh, like what would be the empirical dialoteias. Now, um, I have jumped over several parts of this work, but the, the point of, 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 the, of the verification of, of, uh, of the dialoteias, in, in spite of the fact that I don't claim that they exist, uh, it's very interesting because even the, the, they come from, a, from, the, from Graham's treatment of uh, how uh, inconsistent, uh, observationally inconsistent theories should be tested. According to him, uh, according to him, we should. It is not possible to test them uh, by in the falsificationist way, as I already, as I, I as I have also stated. But uh, we need to. Mm, please let me find for a moment. Okay. Okay. So he says, for example, here that a theory such that implies phi and not phi cannot has to be rejected if we fail to observe such a contradiction. Mm, for example, if we have that neither phi nor not phi are incompatible with T because they are both implied by it. The route to or the path to of observing a state of affairs 
uh, would seem useless for rejecting it. And hence, it seems that we can only recourse to non-observing the state of affairs denoted by this contradiction. However, I think that although Chris codifies this proposal in a quasi-falsificationist uh, or rejectionist terms, he seems to be uh, he seems to be a more uh, verificationist tentative. Now, I don't want to delve too much into this, but the idea is that uh, it is not so much about the uh, it is not so much about uh, that our observation is have, have to be, sorry all of all our, our observations can do here is either verify or falsify but we cannot observe something that would make us reject it that's uh, what I take from Graham so in some priest proposal urges us to reject T in the absence of positive evidence not because of counter evidence uh, unless, of course, we want to frame the absence of positive evidence as some way counter evidence, but I find this too difficult because, for example, suppose that we have uh, a theory that implies phi and uh, psi, where these two do not contradict in any way, in principle, presumably. So, in that case, I think that no science would be that. Uh, this uh, conjunction is to be rejected. Uh, ah, okay, okay, sorry. I jumped one part. Okay. Suppose that T uh, implies phi, C and phi, where these do not contradict in any way, presumably at least. It could be the case that we observe C, but we do not observe, uh, sorry, that we observe phi, but we do not observe any of C or not C. In this case, no scientist would say that C, that phi and C is to be rejected for this may be due to our limitations in current instruments like the thesis one shows because uh, it's possible that we are not able to observe the, the sentence phi, sorry, C or not C, but it's, this is no evidence that, this is no evidence that we are not, that, that, that phi is true or false, or that there is uh, that there is no uh, holding of of this sentence of C. So even if we are not able to observe uh, not C, our most reasonable presumption would be that that uh, not not phi is not current is currently not observable. But we need much more than this to reject it. So. We need to observe something that is incompatible with it uh, being the case. So perhaps some other sentence expressing an observable state of affairs according to inference, which according to inference would force us to reject it. So re the reasoning we use for, for these two sentences that are not precisely, uh, that are not, uh, that do not contradict in any way, presumably, can also be applied for the case where they do contradict for P, phi and not phi. Uh, there is no reason uh, a priori for uh, making a special case for uh, for the case where the two sentences contradict. So, well, I, I, I suggest that if, if we say that it should be otherwise, it's, it looks more like an introduction of the dialectics, where uh, an, or an ad hoc uh, reasoning from the dialectics for saving his theory and maybe dictating science from the science from the armchair, like Jonas Becker says. Now, now I, I want to I want to finish by mentioning. Uh, Finally, what would be the what would be the solution to this? So, if we already agreed that we can do things by a two-sided uh, by a two-sided uh, or two-fold testing process, it means that some sentences are going to be the potential corroborators, and some sentences but will be also there will also be some group of sentences that will make us reject our theory. And those potential rejectors uh, 
as I will call them, and this follows the uh, priest terminology, which is, a, I think, an important uh, uh, part of uh, an important part of take from his from his treatment is that well it's very simple indeed uh, the potential rejectors of a theory would be all those potential falsifiers that are not also potential corroborators Luis yes I'm really sorry but uh, we are running out of time uh, I know that we have it some time for uh, comments or questions yes to ask just you, please perfect just give me two minutes because just need to this is the final two paragraphs so having said that the the set of potential rejectors of a theory which would be defined in this way could not include any sentences that are dialetheas and the reason is the following because we have already established that it is very although we can have an argument for them to be verifiable if we follow priests uh, uh, works that I have previously mentioned it is very difficult to to formulate a way in which they could be rejected uh, now having said that we have, would have to redefine the, the empirical content of an inconsistent theory as another pair which would be which would not be redundant would be form would be comprised by the potential corroborators and rejectors of the theory which are defined as i said before and to finish i just want to say that uh well i i will not have the time to do it in in, in the way i wanted but uh, uh, the problem with this, with with my solution, at least from the dialectic point point of view, is that there is no uh, there is no way to test the theory uh, that the to 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 test the theory as far as uh, re in, in the rejection is way on the falsification is way from the point of view of their consist on their inconsistent consequences and if we don't have that tool because of logical reasons of uh, then we are in a serious trouble from the point of view of that dial taste because they do not uh, they they cannot they can formulate an, a, an empirically inconsistent theory observationally inconsistent theory more precisely but they cannot uh, they cannot uh, they cannot advance any condition in which that inconsistency could be uh, could be uh, could be f f rejected the theory cannot be rejected on the on the on, uh, from their inconsistency inconsistent consequences so that would be uh, uh, a loss for from the point of view of the Empiric, the observational dialetatis or empirical dialetatis but uh, it is possible that this is not a great loss because uh, the few persons that have advanced uh, empirical dialetatis the dialetatis have not made it have not made this idea their the most important in their system so well uh, I leave it up to you to decide if this work is sufficiently critical of them. So that would be all. Thank you, Bruno. Thank you. Thank you.